And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsie. going to be as many episodes at the, as the Genovese crime family was, but we're going to do what we do best here. Uh, today's intro episode to the Gambino crime family probably will not be as long because I want to space it out because the next show is going to be absolutely a lot of information. So I want to give you a little bit of the time uh, because one of the things that I did hear back from the listeners who do listen to the show is that there was just so much information that I had to go back and listen to it two or three times to, to sort of get a collective. So I'm going to take it a little bit slower uh, to give everybody sort of uh, a heads up. So most people, when they think of the Gambino crime family, uh, you know, a few things come to mind almost immediately. The first thing is, you know, obviously Carlo Gambino, uh, the hit on Paul Castellano, and of course, John Gotti. Uh, the Gambino crime family has been one of the most powerful and dangerous crime families in the existence of organized crime. Uh, while they didn't begin that way, once Carlo Gambino took over the family, uh, he expanded northwest, south, and east, and took control of the rackets and unions, and his forefathers, you know, he did things that his forefathers just couldn't conceive. Uh, and still, even to this day, uh, the Gambino crime family is one of the wealthiest and most dangerous crime family. Oh, excuse me coffee uh one of the most dangerous crime families still around uh what carlo and those before him built uh still stand to this day uh even if the 1980s almost decimated them uh most people often pick up the discussion on the gambino crime family as carlo gambino begins his you know m- meteoric rise uh but the gambinos or at least what uh, at least before they would become the actual gambinos started way prior to Carlo's arrival. Uh, many claim it was Vincent Mangano who was the forefather, but it actually went back to the Mineo crime family. Traditionally, the Gambino crime family has held turf in Virginia, Florida, New York, Connecticut, California, Baltimore, Las Vegas, Sicily, and in New Jersey. Uh, according to sources, the family sits at around 150, 200 made guys and somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 associates, but I believe that number is probably going to be a little bit smaller than that. Uh, they've been associated with labor, racketeering, murder, extortion, fraud, gambling, money laundering, uh, drug trafficking, truck hijackings, loan sharking, prostitution, pornography, and the list goes on and on and on. But before we get to that, we have to take a step back in time a bit. And while I know some of this material is going to be regurgitated from past shows uh, in the recent Genovese, even even the recent Genovese crime family history shows, uh, it's just a part of history. And I'm going to do my best not to rehash things uh, that we discuss all the time. And I'm also going to try my best to highlight what I think is most important that you get out of this. Uh, So we can't talk about the Gambinos without mentioning, as usual, two familiar names. Uh, the start of the Gambinos directly can be traced back to Sicily, then to New York through Ignazio Lupo. When Lupo and Giuseppe Morello were sent packing 30 years for counterfeiting, their boss, Salvatore Toto uh, D'Achilla, took over. Uh, D'Achilla arrived in the United States in the 1900s, settling in East Harlem. Lupo's crew was one of the first criminal organizations in New York City, and eventually he would merge his group with Morello, and they would establish what would become the Morello crime family. As we said uh, in 1910, Morello and Lupo end up going away for counterfeiting and D'Aquila steps up, forming his own sort of family called uh, the Palermitani family in East Harlem. That's something that you don't hear very often. Uh, D'Aquila would use his power to establish relationships with other mobsters. So in 1910, Uh, More Italian organized crime groups sort of begin to form and they begin to come together. The Morellos, 
the the Parliamentani uh, owned East Harlem, and they began sort of moving into Manhattan, into Little Italy. And then on the flip side of that, in Brooklyn, uh, you had other groups that were forming. Niccolo Shiro was establishing his own family, which consisted of members directly from Castamolari del Golfo. Also in Brooklyn, Alfred Maneo began his own criminal family as well. And at the same time, uh, one at the same time this is all sort of going on, two of Morello's top captains break away from the family and they end up heading to the Bronx to to start their own family, and that would have been Gaetano Reina, would have been the guy that did that. In South Brooklyn, uh, you had another group led by Johnny Torrio, then Frankie Yale and Coney Island. Uh, you would have had Camorra representatives in Pellegrino and Murano and Alessandro Valero. Uh, so we see the very beginnings of the five families right there. So let's break it down. In East Harlem and Manhattan, you had the Morellos and the Parliament, excuse me, the Palermitani crime family. In the Bronx, you had Gaetano Reina. In Brooklyn, you had Niccolo Shiro and Alfred Mineo. In South Brooklyn, you had Johnny Torrio and Frankie Yale. In Coney Island, you had Pellegrino. Uh, Murano and Alessandro Valero. Uh, so Niccolo Shiro arrives in the United States via Italy in 1902 uh, via Sicily. Uh, what's interesting about Shiro is he settles into Brooklyn and becomes a member of the Castamolari Mafia. Uh, it's interesting because uh, they only accepted members traditionally that were from their own village, that village being Castamolari del Golfo. Uh, and for Shiro to be accepted not coming from that same village is definitely not sort of the normal routine uh, it's just not something that they did shiro truly uh wouldn't become boss until 1912 and then by 1913 gives his support to morello as morello ends up going to war with salvatore di Aquila. the natural successor to that family would have been stefano magadino uh as he was a, a high up captain at the time and shiro was underneath him but magadino pretty much takes off out of new york city uh, because his crew is being watched by the police at the time for other crimes. Uh, a few cases would actually come down the pike, but would collapse when bribes uh, and, and murder was used to sort of fix those issues. But it wouldn't matter because Magadino would end up taking off the Buffalo and would eventually become the boss of his own family anyway. Uh, Shiro also had the distinction of probably... Uh, having the most amount of men leave his family and becoming bosses of their own families, including Frank Lanza, who became boss of San Francisco, Gaspar Malazzo, who would become boss in Detroit, uh, Gaspari Messina, who then would become boss of the New England Mafia. So when Salvatore Maranzano arrives in New York in 1925, he establishes himself as the leader within the Shiro crime family. Shiro allowed Maranzano in. Uh, and obviously, we know that Vito Cachafero had a lot to do with that, but it also affected his power. Uh, Maranzano would then turn around and basically force Shiro to pay him a tribute payment every month, and Shiro would turn over the money and just fucking leave. He ended up going back to, to Italy, believe it or not. He saw he saw the writing on the fucking wall and says, nah, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Uh, and it's important to bring up Shiro because if he does not give in to Maranzano, it's likely the Castamolari War may not have happened. Once again, there were a lot of things at play, so it probably would have, but it might not have. Uh, in 1916, the Camorra hits uh, Nicholas Morello, uh, who had taken over the Morello since his brother ended up going to prison. In response to that, Salvatore Diachillo would align himself with the Morellos to take on the Camorra. So Diachillo kind of went back and forth. Uh, in 1917, Morello and Valero end up getting pinched for murder. And they end up going to the can for life sentences with both off the streets. The Aquila uh, and Shiro crime family began to take over Brooklyn. The Aquila eventually would absorb the Mineo crime family uh, and would make Alfredo Mineo his underboss. Uh, Mineo was a killer and a tough guy, but he faced a problem because taking over uh, for uh, taking over for the Aquila was going to be an issue with him. Uh, for him, especially rivalry, turf gripes would lead Diakilla to want to whack Joe Morello and his top uh, associates, uh, his top aide who was uh, Umberto. As soon as they got out of prison, his whole idea was he was going to kill them. That way they couldn't regain power. Uh, Morello could have easily come out and have gone to war with him. Uh, and that's something that Diakilla did worry about. 
Uh, and so what ends up happening is Pittsburgh boss Nicola Gentile steps in on behalf of Morello, and Diakilla just sort of lets the whole thing go. And that was sort of the smart thing to do at the time um, uh, because Umberto Valente, uh, who pretty much uh, was Joe Morello's number two, uh, with Diakilla not killing him, and letting it go, it ends up saving his life, and he ends up using that sort of against him to sort of recruit him into his family so that they could go out after Morello uh, and his new number two, Joe Massaria. So it put Maneo in a situation where he was either going to get whacked or he was going to lose power to Umberto Valente, but he gets very lucky when Valente ends up getting killed in 1922 uh, by Morello and Massaria hitters for his betrayal of Morello. Uh, Maneo was no dummy, and he recognizes that Diakilo was stretching himself thin and that Masseria was going to be the, probably the biggest powerhouse in New York. Uh, and he ends up going to his buddy Steve Ferrigno, and they decide to get down with Masseria, and they play Diakilo. Uh As the heat begins to grow, Prohibition would enter, and so then it becomes a scramble to take over the Rackets. Uh, the only rival to Salvatore Diaquila, or the only guy who could challenge him, was Joe Massaria, who was a valuable captain at the time and a deadly leader within the Morello crime family. For the most part, by 1920, he had taken over the day-to-day operations of, of the Morello crime family, and he was fully controlling the Rackets. By the mid-1920s, his power really grows in a major way, and Diaquila wanted to push ahead with war. October 10th of 1928, Diakilo gets clipped outside of his house. His underboss, Alfredo Mineo, would end up taking the uh, taking over the family, and he had the biggest family that had the Zips uh, in New York City. So, by 1930, we know the Casamari War begins. The war was between Masseria and Maranzano, who was now leading the Shiro crime family. Mineo and Ferrigno would end up getting killed as a result for trying to kill Masseria in 1930. And in 1931, we know that Masseria ends up getting killed. Uh, and then in the 1931, Maranzano gets clipped. Prior to Maranzano getting clipped, he ends up naming Frank Scalise the head of the Diakilla Mineo crime family. And we're bringing all of that up because it's setting the stage. Uh, so when Lucky Luciano takes over, he immediately replaces Frank Scalise with Vincent Mongano. Uh, not only is he elevated to boss, but he's handed a seat on the newly formed commission, and he is the first noted boss that would become the what is what we know today is the Gambino crime family. Mongano was a vicious, highly intelligent guy. His nickname wasn't the executioner for no fucking reason. Uh, his way of doing things was to kill. No argument out of him, no agreement, no nothing. I'll, you step sideways with him, you're going to get killed. Uh, he would also help control Murder Incorporated from 1931 to 1951. What Mongano was especially good at was shakedowns and union rackets. He controlled the docks with an iron fist. Uh, something down the line that Carlo Gambino would do very well and push even further uh, than most would ever conceive of. Mongano forced dock workers uh, to pay every single day for the right to work. Uh, and it was d devised that way so that he could control them. Uh, he also forced shipping companies to pay a tribute. Otherwise, he wouldn't let the ships dock. Uh, and, and it also forced uh, uh, sort of the hand of, of basically saying to them, you don't pay your cargo, or if you don't pay a tax, we're not going to unload your cargo or uh, unload or load your cargo. So you're going to be sitting there and you're not going to get any fucking money. Uh, and so that was something... Uh, he was really the first guy to put that tax on people, uh, which we know Carlo Gambino ultimately would carry even further. But then he moves fully to control the Brooklyn Local 814 of the ILA, and he ends up naming Anthony Anastasio the president, who was Albert Anastasia's brother. Their name was Anastasia before the, or excuse me, their name was Anastasio when they came to the country. They changed it to Anastasia uh, years later. So as Mongano takes over, he names Albert Anastasia his underboss and Joe Biondo his consigliere. While Mongano was considered, you know, a mustache Pete in, in sort of every sense, uh, he was a little bit more advanced than, than Maranzano and Masseria. He was a little more open-minded. He realized that change had to come, but he still believed in the core values of Cosa Nostra. Uh, he knew eventually that prohibition would end, and, and he wanted to make sure that his family would prosper, and prosper they did as they moved into extortion, unions, gambling, uh, illegal lottery, the numbers racket, and murder for hire. 
it was something that neither neither Maranzano or Massaria was really interested in. Uh, well, both were smart guys and both had acumen for for rackets. They just didn't see past prohibition. And others like Luciano and Mangano and Genovese knew differently. They knew that they had to expand. Uh, and that's why the Atlantic City Conference happened to begin with. And we've talked at length about it. But to refresh you a bit, it was a meeting to, it was a meeting that was with gangsters from all across the nation. And there were a couple topics. They wanted to talk about Capone whacking everybody in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre because they wanted to get the heat off the mafia. Uh, Lucio, uh, Luciano also wanted to cut off, uh, excuse me, cut up turf, and he wanted to plan for the day that prohibition ended. He wanted things in place uh, like the drug rackets. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, uh, then I suggest you go back and listen to the Genovese Crime Family History Episode 1, 2, and 3. We talk extensively uh, about the Havana Conference, and we talk extensively about Appalachian, and we talk extensively about the Atlantic City Convention. Uh, Mangano would establish probably what was the first mafia social club in the city of New York. He called it the Democratic Club, and it was meant to promote American values. But meanwhile, in the back, you know, they're playing cards, they're gambling, and it was the place for mobsters to meet and discuss business, specifically Murder Incorporated. Uh, Murder Incorporated was green, greenlit in 1929. Uh, Murder Incorporated excuse me, uh, <clears throat> Murder, Inc. would be the first conglomerate that handed handed out mob murders, sanctioned mob hits, uh, murder for hire. Look at it as the law enforcement arm of the mafia. Uh, the group would be split into really, uh, they weren't really split. They were, they were in one large group, but they wanted representation. And uh, the group's president uh, was at first uh, Louis Lepke Buckhalter, uh, and sort of the thing was, and let me step back for a second because I just misspoke. Uh, Albert Anastasia was put in control of Murder Incorporated. Uh, Meyer Lansky felt that, this, considering that Murder Inc. was both Jewish and Italian, they wanted a Jewish representation. So Louis Lepke Buckhalter was also named uh, co president. Uh, Anastasia would handle the Italian side of things, uh, and Louis Lepke would handle the Jewish conglomerate. Murder Inc. is widely responsible for committing somewhere between 400 and 1,000 contracted murders that we know about from 1929 to 1941. Could be less, could be more. Uh, and here's a list of some of those members just because the name the name's like an all-star team of hitters. Uh, Louis Lepke, Benny, Benny Siegel, Meyer Lansky, Albert Anastasia, Charlie the Bug Workman, Frank Abandondo, Frankie Carbo, uh, Louis Cohen, Philip Cohen, Neil Della Croach, Jacob Drucker, Martin Goldstein, Hyman Holtz, Louis Kravitz, Philip Kovalik, Sam Levine, Seymour Magoon, Harry Myon, Abe Rellis, Sidney Souls, Jacob Shapiro, who was a tough guy, my God, Harry Strauss, uh, Ali Tannenbaum, Mendy Weiss, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. Uh, Joe Biondo from day one was an extortionist, a murderer, and was widely the guy in charge for the Mangano crime family as far as labor racketeering. Uh, he also was the first guy to really move and control the taxi industry in the city, uh, and he was a complete mobster in every sense. Biondo's value was paramount to Mangano. In the early days of Prohibition, Biondo worked with both Lucky Luciano and Dutch Schultz and was often sort of the mediator between the two guys as they didn't always get along. Uh, he was a trusted guy and so trusted that Luciano recruited him to whack Salvatore Maranzano while Biondo could have probably risen to the top. He was one of these guys that he realized early on that sitting at the top of the, the food chain was probably not the best idea for him, would probably bring problems for him. And so what he focuses on is, is expanding his rackets into legitimate companies as well. He owned car dealerships, had a big shipping import-export business out of Queens, uh, and Biondo would eventually help Carlo Gambino, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So Mangano ends up forging close ties with a guy by the name of Emil Camarda, who was the vice president of the ILA, which is the Longshoremen's Association. Uh, Mangano had had designs on taking over the union completely, and through uh, Camarda, was actually able to take over the union in Brooklyn and, and in Manhattan. Mangano also wanted a man of his own 
to sort of put in charge of the union and the docks. They wanted to control not just the union, but everything that happened on the docks. And what they do is they put Anthony Anastasio, i.e. Anthony Anastasia, who was Albert Anastasia's brother, in charge of that. Uh, Anthony, people don't often talk about Anthony, but he was a fucking earner. When I mean earner, we're talking about Tony Salerno type of numbers. Uh, Not as big, but that's one thing that they never fucking mentioned. He was an animal in terms of fucking money grabbing. He stole millions millions of dollars uh, in small-time robberies. He, he got millions of dollars in kickbacks, stolen merchandise. He would inflate union dues uh, and in, in massive payoffs. And so for nearly 30 years, Anthony Anastasia controlled the docks. A lot of people think Albert Anastasia did, but it wasn't. It was his brother. Now, if anybody beefed with him, he would mention his brother and they would knock off the fucking nonsense. Uh, but one of the more infamous things that Anthony did was right after Lucky Luciano got hit with that pandering charge. Uh, and we all know that the U.S. government offered Luch- Lucky Luciano a deal, uh, but we haven't really ever discussed why. And it's not that I neglected to mention it. I was saving it for this specific episode. Uh, you know, listen, the government wasn't just going to offer Lucky Luciano a deal out of, uh, you know, the thin air. And the deal was, you know, can you protect the ports? If you protect the ports, we'll let you out early, et cetera, et cetera, but you could get deported. If you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, go back to, I think it's episode three of the Genovese crime family. We talk uh, specifically about that. Uh, but what happens is Anthony sort of has an idea and he ends up going to his brother Albert with the idea. If they bombed or they blew up or they torched a U.S. ship in the port in New York or on the Brooklyn docks, what it might do is scare the city and it might scare the military and it may be coming to them for help. Uh, Albert really wasn't sure about the whole kind of thing, but Anthony explained that naval intelligence, everybody knew that naval intelligence was looking for Italians and Germans who might be involved in some plot to sabotage Navy ships on the dock. So if a ship gets fucking attacked, maybe that with, with naval intelligence crawling around everywhere, maybe they'll come to us and ask us to protect the fucking docks. Uh, there was a French luxury ship named the SS Normandy, which was currently at that time being converted into a troop transport and was docked at the Hudson River Pier, which the Monganos fully controlled. Ends up, a fire breaks out on February 9th of 1942 and burns to the fucking depths, and the, the ship sinks relatively quickly. That worried naval intelligence, and they would reach out to the mafia for help, and that's how it all began for Luciano. At the same time, Carlo Gambino would be promoted, as well as his cousin Paul Castellano. They would go from... Uh, being the pretty much associates to soldiers at that point. Carlo Gambino was born in Palermo, Sicily in 1902. Uh, his family, along with the Castellanos, were mob heavyweights in Italy, and the Castellanos had already immigrated to the United States and become powerful. became powerful before, before Carlo Gambino arrived. Now, Carlo Gambino was already a made guy in the mafia in Italy, uh, during his teenage years, he was widely responsible for at least four murders in Italy before departing at 19 for American shores. He arrives in Norfolk, Virginia in 1921 and would travel up to New York. As he began his life in, of crime in New York, he was in the Masseria crime family. In 1937, Gambino would end up getting pinched in Philadelphia and would serve 22 months in prison for tax evasion, which was directly related to a million-gallon booze distillery in philadelphia so while mangano at the same time was highly intelligent and utilized control by murder he and albert anastasia had a real rough relationship they consistently butted heads on a number of issues Uh, they would end up working together for 20 years but like i said they would battle over turf they would battle over money they would battle over drugs they would battle over record uh, rackets and ultimately would lead to just shouting matches and in some cases fist fights uh, the main issue was is that Mangano wanted someone con- totally subverb subverb excuse me subverb my fucking he wanted somebody totally subverbient yeah that's it subverbient to him um, and the fact that Luciano Costello and Joe Bonanno used him for murders and other things and in other rackets without Mangano's permission really made him begin to feel like Anastasia's loyalty wasn't in the right place. And he feared that Luciano's move on Masseria and Maranzano could overflow onto him. And it, it makes sense. It totally makes sense. Uh, 
it was something for him to worry about. Magno also worried about the power that Anastasia was beginning to wield, especially within Murder Incorporated and especially on the waterfront unions. But this is a guy he put in charge of a lot of things. Uh, and, and, and so it's just, it, we've seen this uh, typically happen in the mafia where a guy picks a guy because he trusts him, he's a tough guy, and it comes back to bite him in the ass. And it would in this situation too. Uh, Albert Anastasia came to the United States illegally, sneaking on a freighter uh, bound for New York City from Italy in 1919. He brought with him his brothers Anthony, Joseph, and Gerardo. As they arrive, they immediately get work on the Brock, uh, on the docks <coughs> in Brooklyn. By 1921, Anastasia made his mark by whacking George Torino, uh, who also worked on the docks. The two, the two exchanged words, and Anastasia beat him to death with a hammer. Uh, Anastasia... Oh, geez. Anastasia would be arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death in Sing Sing. There was a legal technicality, and Anastasia ends up winning a new trial on appeal. In 1922, he would go back on trial for that murder, but four of the original witnesses against him suddenly disappeared. <laughs> without, without witnesses, Anastasia would walk. After he walked, he changed his name from Umberto Anastasio to Albert Anastasia. In 1923, he would get picked up again for illegal possession of a firearm. He would do close to a two-year bid, and then he would get out. By the late 1920s, he becomes an ILA leader, controlling two chapters in Brooklyn. It was through the docks that he became uh, a member in the Massaria crime family and had close friendships with Joe Adonis, Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. And that's sort of how he got his start. So when the Casamari War broke wide open, it was Anastasia, Genovese, Adonis, and ben, Joe Adonis and Benny Siegel who showed, showed up at Nuova Villa tomorrow on Coney Island where Luciano was meeting with Masseria to sort of mend fences. Luciano, just like in The Godfather, would excuse himself to use the restroom, and the boys walked in, and it was Masser, and it was, uh, and, and pretty much lit Masseria the fuck up, shot him to death. Uh, in 1932, Anastasia had a disagreement with a guy, which led to some very interesting yet hilarious actions. Uh, my buddy Andrew is going to love this. <laughs> so uh, Anastasia, and, and this is not a story you're going to hear anywhere else. This is a story that I got from somebody uh, who is well into their 80s that, that knows the story well. Uh, somebody went to Anastasia and complained that they knew somebody that was working on the docks that was beating on it, beating on his wife. I mean, and pretty badly, too. Uh, Anastasia summons the guy uh, to a little office. Uh, he asks a couple questions, and the guy pretty much admits that he beats his wife and that Anastasia should really mind his own fucking business. <laughs> Probably not a great idea. Anastasia grabs an ice pick and stabs the guy through his balls to a shipping crate. <laughs> then he takes out another ice pick and starts stabbing him to death he would be charged and indicted for that but due to a lack of evidence those charges would be dropped <laughs> he threw his balls into a crate <laughs> six months later he was in a laundry service store and a worker got fresh with him Anastasia left and came back with a pipe and beat him to death <laughs> once again uh, nobody was willing to testify against Albert Anastasia, and he walked. Uh, because Anastasia was loyal to the cause, Luciano uh, named him and Louis Lepke the presidents of Murder, Inc. Uh, Anastasia wasn't just loyal to his boss, but also to his friends. In 1939, when Louis Lepke was having problems with Mo Morris Diamond, who was a Teamsters union official uh, who was really being a pain in the ass, and he was trying to step in front of Lepke uh, from taking over the garment district, Anastasia had him killed. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just cracks me up because there's going to be a lot of murder and mayhem here. In 1939, Anastasia has Peter Panto killed. Panto was an ILA activist who was attempting to lead a movement uh, for democratic reforms in the union local chapters, and he wouldn't back down. He was warned he wouldn't. Anastasia had enough and had him killed and dismembered and buried on a farm in New Jersey. In 1941, Abrellis decides to testify. Abrellis, who was a psychopath, was formerly in Murder Incorporated, ends up getting pinched and becomes a rat. Uh, Rellis had ratted out seven murder members of Murder, Inc., and I believe a bunch of them actually got the death penalty and were executed. Uh, Rellis also had in information that Anastasia specifically, 
uh, had been involved in the Panto and Diamond murders. Uh, and Anastasia wasn't fucking around. And he sent word that he was offering $100,000 for anybody who could end and put an end to this prick's mouth. Uh, eventually, cops would take the bribe uh, and they would toss Relis out the fucking window to his death. Uh, the prick could sing, but he couldn't fly. Uh, and you wonder why Vincent Mangano was terrified in a sense of Albert Anastasia. So that's part one of the Gambino crime family. Uh, and like I said, the reason why we did it this way is because next week is going to be twice as long than usual because there's a lot of cover, a lot to cover, and a lot of individual people we have to cover. So that is gonna, that is part one of the Gambino crime family. I tried to keep it as minimal as possible because next week uh, we're going to be dealing with. Uh, so picture it as a big wheel with a bunch of spokes that go out in a million different directions. And so I wanted to keep it basic this week as far as, okay, Mangano, this is how Mangano got there. Okay, Shiro, we know we understood he gave up his family. We understand Al Maneo was pushed out and killed. Uh, and now we understand that Mangano has issues with Albert Anastasia. We know Albert Anastasia's connection to the docks, to other people. We know what Carlo Gambino was doing at the time. So those that know mob history know where this is going. You already know where we're going to go with this because we talked about Albert Anastasia a lot and Carlo Gambino, but this is going to go from here past John Gotti. So we have a lot to cover, and I wanted to keep it as minimal as possible this week. So moving forward to next week, it will be part two of the game.